The term artificial intelligence was first coined in 1956 in a research proposal where it was imagined that if machines were able to solve the problems that were in the exclusive domains of the humans back then, significant progress could be made. And they further went on to claim that if a group of scientists got together for just one summer, they could achieve this feat. The funny part is, they overestimated it and they were wildly optimistic about it because the decades that followed the publishing of that paper, artificial intelligence as a discipline didn't really make a great lot of progress. It kind of sputtered along, gave some results, but not something that was earth shattering. In fact, the experts and the scientists that were working in the field of artificial intelligence started shunning using this term artificial intelligence because there was nothing intelligent about it. It was a lot of promise with very little delivery. But in the last few years, there has been a revolution of sorts. Suddenly, artificial intelligence systems are doing and solving problems at an incredible pace that was unimaginable even a decade back. They are solving problems that AI experts themselves had said would probably not be possible to solve in our lifetimes. So there is this renaissance kind of a moment that artificial intelligence is experiencing in the world at this point in time. So what really changed? We don't know that yet. But this current hype, if you will, is as new as it may seem, as fresh as it may seem, is essentially based on an old idea. An old idea called the artificial neural networks, which in turn is based on an even older idea as old as mankind itself. And that concept is a biological brain. This is a marvel of nature. Our biological brains consist of billions and billions of neurons that are interconnected. And in response to external stimuli, these neurons fire up. And one neuron ends up firing up another and so on a hundred billion times. But each neuron fires slightly differently. It gets triggered slightly differently than the previous one. Which means that each neuron is interpreting this external stimulus slightly differently. And as a cumulative effect of this, all of these neurons help the brain to learn. And as it learns, it adapts. And as it adapts, it evolves. And that evolution is intelligence. Artificial neural networks try to mimic this exact behavior of the biological brain. Artificial neural networks between an input layer and an output layer, there are multiple hidden layers that are created. Each of them are capable of taking independent decisions. And this combination of these layers essentially lets these artificial neural networks learn and evolve and eventually become more smarter. And that's the word intelligence starts coming to that. But irrespective whether it is a biological neural network or an artificial neural network. All these neural networks learn by examples. And for that, they need to be trained. The biological neural network, the best example is a child, a human child. How does a human child learn? The child goes and interacts and engages with the environment to pick up things. Don't touch this, touch this, this is hot, this is cold, this is sweet, this is sour. See that, right? Try giving, a, try giving a lemon to a child and see the expression. It's fun. What's happening is these hidden layers are learning. And who's training them? We adults are training them. Don't touch that. Do this. Don't do that. So there is a combination of examples and there is a combination of training that makes them better. It's the same concept, the same innocent status is for these artificial neural networks when they start out. They need training and they need a lot of examples. This is a classic picture of how an artificial neural network, AI system as we call it, gets trained. 
This picture, as you can see, is of a flying fish on a water on the ocean. The way this neural network has learned it, it says it's a small white bird flying over a body of water. Well, they got a lot of it right, but then they missed the flying fish. They call it a bird because we all know that on the internet, much of the images there are more images of birds than flying fish. So it learned from what the example was actually offered to it. So this is the concept through which intelligence grows with getting a lot more training and a lot of examples. But if this was the case, then why is it, unlike a human child, an artificial neural networks kind of remain stagnant for a lot of years, a lot of decades, and suddenly there is so much spurt of action in this thing. What really changed? What is it that caused this? Well, there are a lot of theories, but I reckon there are three which are very important. The first one has been development of newer training techniques. There are techniques that are helping go deeper into these hidden layers, as we call them. In the past, the layers were just about one or two, but now it is not uncommon to have 30, 40 hidden layers. More layers means more abstraction. And when there is more abstraction in terms of learning, the applicability becomes much more wider. It starts impacting the whole part of our lives in various forms. And that is probably the reason why they're getting so much importance. The second piece has been the phenomenal rise of the internet. Suddenly we have billions of documents, pictures, videos, all of them available. And each of them are kind of an example to train these artificial uh, networks. But for all this, you need strong computing power. We all have heard about CPUs, right? They are supposed to be the heart and brain of all computers that we have. Seems like they have a very cute cousin called the GPUs, the graphical processing units. These chips are the ones that are responsible for all the cool graphics that you have on your smartphones. It so turns out that they are also very well suited for modeling these AI systems. And the biggest advantage that they bring to the table is they can increase the speed of learning for this AI systems over a hundred times. So suddenly you have a magical combination of these three important factors that has led to this revolution of sorts when it comes to growth in artificial intelligence. And the new term that has been coined for it is deep learning. Learning which can get as abstract as it is possible because of it, it has more wider applicability, more general purpose applicability than what was possible in the past. And this, let me also illustrate this with an example as to how fast we are moving. In 1997, for the first time, a machine beat a human to a game of chess. We all know about it, right? Deep Blue beating Gary Kasparov, the grandmaster back then. But even back then, the AI experts claimed that it would still take at least a century, if not more, for machines to beat humans at more complex games like Go. Guess what? Early this year, AlphaGo, a general purpose AI system built by Google, uh, Google Technologies DeepMind project, actually beat the leading world champion Lee Sedol five games to one. And it's a very complex game. For each move in the game of Go, there are 250 possible next moves. So it just tells you how complicated this game is. And when Lee Sedol reflected on his defeat at the hands of this computer, he said that I don't think if I go into a rematch, I will, I'm going to win against this machine because this machine surprised me. It was learning and evolving as I was making my moves. And that is the big difference. This time, a general purpose artificial intelligence system learned in real time against a human and beat the human at it. Unlike DeepMind, which uh, unlike uh, uh, Deep Blue, which impressive for its time, was still a supercomputer crafted to do only one thing, just play chess. And use just sheer brute power of processing to beat the, uh, beat, beat the human opponent. But here, the machine was learning and learning in real time. And that is the speed at which things are going. From a hundred years prediction, it has come down to less than two decades. 
So that is the speed at which things are going. Now one would say that much of it is still happening in the virtual world behind a screen. How is it impacting my real life? Well, not true. Driverless cars are almost round the corner. It's no longer science fiction. It's just round the corner. It's not going to take many years. <coughs> when major car manufacturers start announcing partnerships with major tech companies and saying that they will launch driverless cars in the next five to six years, you have to take it seriously because artificial intelligence systems are changing some fundamentally established platforms. Artificial intelligence is, is touching our lives in more ways than one. They are doing training, they are going to, they are helping us already in the healthcare sector. Cancer has been a mysterious disease because the same cancer can affect various body types differently and people respond to medication very differently. This is where the power of artificial intelligence comes in because they are actually becoming super assistants for some of the doctors to start treating these complex diseases as time goes by. In fact, there is so much excitement around it that some of the die-hard romantics are saying that the day is not far before humans will start having romantic relationship with AI systems. Who knows, maybe they'll start dating. And it could be an interesting future. We don't know what, what this will eventually end up taking us. So it's like a very positive, very happy, very, very positive world. Right? Until you see this. You guys remember this movie? So mankind's fear has come back. Is, is it too much? Is it just getting out of hand? Will it end up destroying us? All those kinds of nice fantasy questions comes in Hollywood and Bollywood keep churning out nice movies around. But jokes apart, artificial intelligence, as impressive as it may be, based on this deep learning, it has got a lot of, lot, lot of growth. But at the end of the day, it still does a very specific set of things. There are some naysayers who say, you know, we have suddenly have discovered this great power, this great and dangerous power, that before we have even realized how to harness it properly. And that's why these fantasies come that day, Terminator style annihilation of mankind versus some real world problems like what will happen to humans in terms of jobs, what will happen to their security. These are questions we cannot ignore. Because intelligence, by definition, if it peaks out below a threshold, it peters out. It doesn't matter much. It goes away. But if it crosses a threshold, then it can compound very, very quickly. And then we, we don't know where it will eventually end up. But the interesting part is nobody knows what that threshold is. And what you do not know, you must not worry about. So, all these fears of machines outwitting humans, well, I think it's a couple of years away, a couple of decades away. We don't know how far it is. We don't know it yet. The point to understand is, technology never evolves in isolation. It evolves in the context of the society that we live in. And the prejudices of the society find their ways into these technologies. So, any of the primal fears that we may have that there will, these machines will turn rogue, they will become evil, they will kill us in our sleep, I think we can put them to rest. It's not, it's, it's, it's something that is not possible in the, in, in, in the near future. But what we should instead be debating about is what kind of impact they are having on our jobs, on society as a whole. Fortunately, this question was asked and even answered 200 years back, much before computers existed. This was during the Industrial Revolution. Even back then, there was fear and anger that machines will take away the livelihood. And there were these workers, some of them, who literally thought machines as the enemy and they went ahead and literally attacked and beat them up. They were called the Luddites. Go and read up about them. Very fascinating history about them. But fortunately, technology has eventually ended up creating more roles, more jobs. Eventually. Let me give you an example. When the bank cashiers were replaced with ATMs, 
It's not that the bank staffing came now. That led to a rise of a lot of new roles. Telecalling, customer service, sales, marketing, whole bunch of new roles came up. So we don't really have to worry. But if there is anything to learn from this, is that when artificial intelligence systems come in and then they replace humans in the jobs that they are doing, it's not so much about loss of jobs as it is about gaining new skills. As humans, we will have to gain new skills. In this new world, it is going to become imperative that each one of us in this room have to make a vow to ourselves that we will have to be on a journey of lifelong continuous learning because you have to do this. Otherwise, you can keep lamenting that machines are taking away my jobs all over again. But then you always need to have this one up, otherwise you won't go forward. And when such large scale displacement, uh, large scale displacements happen, the society gets affected on the on a larger level. During the industrial age, a great migration from the rural places to urban places happened. And successive governments all over the world denied it for the longest time. They didn't know how to grapple with it. It took them decades, even centuries, before they could create new social systems that could handle this change. And we could probably be sitting on a very similar moment right now. So that is where humans and society, everybody has to come together to take a look at this. But it's also important to know that ultimately we are humans. We are mammals and we are a social animal. Which means there will still be domains, there will still be jobs, there will be areas where character and empathy will matter. It will be important to brush up your social skills because they will matter. Machines can never really replace you in, when it comes to a human connection. So the jobs of tomorrow will have a greater element of these pieces which you cannot ignore anymore. So in conclusion, when from, from the early days of expressing frustration around the slow pace of evolution of artificial intelligence to the current anxiety that it's probably going too fast, when you kind of balance it out and take a sober look, we must probably welcome artificial intelligence in our life because it makes our lives easier. It creates time for us to focus our energy and pursue goals that we are not able to otherwise. Because ultimately, progress is not about knowing all the answers. It is about being open to all the questions. Thank you.